this morning is Romans 6, starting with verse 12. So sin must no longer reign in your mortal body, exacting obedience to the body's desires. You must no longer put its several parts at sin's disposal as implements for doing wrong. No, put yourselves at the disposal of God as dead men raised to life. Yield your bodies to him as implements for doing right. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are no longer under law, but under the grace of God. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Of course not. You know well enough that if you put yourselves at the disposal of a master to obey him, you are slaves of the master whom you obey. And this is true whether you serve sin with death as its result, or obedience with righteousness as its result. But God be thanked you who once were slaves of sin have yielded wholehearted obedience to the pattern of teaching to which you were made subject, and emancipated from sin have become slaves of righteousness, to use words that suit your human weakness, I mean, as you once yielded your bodies to the service of impurity and lawlessness, making for moral anarchy, so now you must yield them to the service of righteousness, making for a holy life. When you were slaves of sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And what was the gain? Nothing but what now makes you ashamed. For the end of that is death. But now free from the commands of sin and bound to the service of God, your gains are such as make for holiness. And the end is eternal life. For sin pays a wage, and the wage is death. But God gives freely, and his gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. And our second reading is continuing in Ruth today, um, starting with verse 6 and reading to the end of the chapter. Thereupon she set out with her two daughters-in-law to return home because she had heard while still in the Moabite country that the Lord had cared for his people and given them food. So with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and took the road home to Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, both of you, to your mother's homes. May the Lord keep faith with you as you have kept faith with the dead and with me. And may he grant each of you security in the home of a new husband. She kissed them and they wept aloud. Then they said to her, We will return with you to your own people. But Naomi said, go back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Am I likely to bear any more sons to be husbands for you? Go back, my daughters. Go. I'm too old to marry again. But even if I could say that I had hope of a child, if I were to marry this night, and if I were to bear sons, would you then wait until they grew up? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, no, my daughters. My lot is more bitter than yours. Because the Lord has been against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and returned to her people. But Ruth clung to her. You see, said Naomi, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Do not urge me to go back and desert you, Ruth answered. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. I swear a solemn oath before the Lord your God. Nothing but death shall divide us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said, no more. And the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was in great excitement about them. And the women said, can this be Naomi? Do not call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, 
or it is a bitter lot that the Almighty has sent me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? The Lord has pronounced against me. The Almighty has brought disaster on me. This is how Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabitess, returned with her from the Moabite country. The barley harvest was beginning when they arrived in Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now some of you weren't here last week, and I started in this. Uh, just the first five verses, but you know, let me go over just a little. You remember the story so far. Elimelech is taking his family over to Moab for a season, right, in order to flee from famine at home. And as the book of Judges says, he did what seemed right in his own eyes, what seemed like the wise decision. But it turned out that the sojourn became ten long, heartbreaking years of loss. And his two sons, Malam and Chilion, both married Moabite wives. And that's actually in disobedience to God's command. And before they can return to the land of Judah, he and his sons die there in Moab. So as we come to verse 6, we see that Naomi left now bereft, you know, broken in mourning with her two Moabite daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. She receives word that the Lord has at last visited his people back home in Judah and provided food for them. So she resolves to make this return journey. And that word return, or turning, return, is crucial in understanding the whole chapter this morning. It appears over and over again, even though the three women's journeys, you know, their returnings end up being very different. So the three set off together, but Naomi believes she can offer her daughters-in-law no prospects of improvement in their poor circumstances should they continue with her. So, you know, they all start off together, but then she stops them and says this. And so she blesses them both. She invokes the name, the covenant name of Almighty God upon them and urges them to return home again, you know, to their Moabite families. So Naomi believes their best hopes of a better life lie in returning to their father's house and finding new families for themselves. For she knows it will be extremely unlikely, humanly speaking, that any child of Israel would even notice a widowed Moabite woman. And so in fact, later when Ruth commits herself, you know, with this vow, commits herself to coming with Naomi all the way home, Naomi doesn't thank her. Did you, did you pick up on that? There, you know, there's no hugs and kisses here as is frequently shown in illustrations of this moment, like if you look in the different Bibles. Um, all we're told is Naomi says, after Ruth says all she does, is she said no more. Her mouth is closed. She says nothing. The best she can manage is silence because Naomi believes she knows just how hard it's going to be for Ruth if she returns with Naomi back to Bethlehem. Just look down at verse 19, which I read, how everyone's all stirred up, right, in astonishment at the return of Naomi. They don't even mention this foreigner tagging on. You know, to be a Moabite, not to mention a widow in Judah in these days, was to be marked kind of on the outside to be sort of an outcast, even though God's law enjoins his own children to act differently toward them, to support them. So, you know, Naomi, knowing that in her heart, is trying hard to spare her daughters-in-law the grief that would, it seems to her, inevitably be their fate, you know, as immigrants in Judah, a hard road ahead. So as they wept with each other, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and then Ruth clung to her, that was the moment Orpah decided to turn back. You know, she takes Naomi's advice and goes back to Moab. She began the journey, but as a result of Naomi's bleak picture of a hopeless future, you know, maybe through viewing the circumstances through her own eyes, 
darkness. Rather than having faith in the covenant of God, she turned back. So both Ruth and Orpah walked along the same road for a while. Both responded in the same way for a season, but while Ruth went on, Orpah turned back. Now, just like we saw with Elimelech last week, you know, the storms of this world, you know, the tough circumstances of our lives can be very hard to navigate and cause us to lose faith in God's promises as we're making our journey, right, from Moab to Bethlehem. We have to remember we're a pilgrim people. And this way sometimes can feel like a very long, but the Lord promises to walk beside us and also beckons us toward our eternal homeland with him. So, you know, thinking about what Orpah decided, I don't blame her at all. Because Naomi is the very antithesis of an evangelist, isn't she? I mean, she's constantly pushing these two away from God and God's people. And her outright recommendation finally being that the gods of Moab may in fact be their best bet. That's what Naomi says. She says the Lord, the Lord God, again, his name. She invokes his name. The Lord's hand has dealt bitterly with her, has caused calamity. The Lord has even testified against her, as some of these translations put it. So that's how Naomi reads it. She believes in the sovereignty of God, all right. She's perfectly orthodox on that point, but she can no longer accept that the sovereign God is a good God. And so when she arrives at Bethlehem and the local women rush out to meet her, look how you know, she responds to their greeting. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, bitter. I went away full. The Lord has brought me back in Wow. You know, at least she's not faking. <laughs> she's not putting a pious face on everything, right? She's totally honest about how she views the situation. But what I want to ask is, and, and what Ruth the book asks, is it totally the reality of the situation? Is she able to truly see faithfully? You know, right here I don't see any word that Israel has the promises of God. I don't see anything about the covenants, about the means of grace, about the living Lord. There's nothing to the effect that God has been working in her midst and has promised to be with his people. Maybe Naomi was blinded in seeing the truth that she'd not gone away full. Had she? She'd gone away starving, dealing with hungry sons. The, the Lord had not brought her back empty either, but with this God-fearing, you're right, younger woman supporting her, clinging to her, vowing to go with her till she dies. It's how you see, right? It reminds us that there may be moments in our lives as Christians when we ourselves can be overwhelmed with bitterness, and fail to see faithfully God's blessings. So as Naomi saw it, there was nothing before her but darkness and desolation, and that filled her soul at that point to the exclusion of everything else. And so it all just spills out. Don't you call me pleasant. This is what the Lord has done to me. What the Lord has done to me. You know, what a terrible threat, heartache, and disappointment can be to our well-being and our love for the Lord. How we should long for the spirit of the apostle who had learned in whatsoever state he was in to be content. Can I say that? Can we say that? There was no melody in Naomi's heart anymore. No gratitude that she'd been spared, that the hand of the Lord had provided her with such a magnificent daughter in law, where she was dwelling, understandably, was the pain. 
And she felt like God had acted in mysterious and undeserving hostility towards her. Now I want you to think about your own life. Have you ever felt that way? Do we focus on the reality of our lives and those around us and wonder, what is God up to here? How could a good God allow such a thing? We all face that question in our hearts if we're honest, like Naomi. Have we allowed the thorns of this life to do to our hearts what it did in Naomi is causing a seed of bitterness toward God to germinate in our souls? Naomi is a soul in despair. She feels that God is somehow out to get her. Out to get her. The Lord testifies against her, she says. You know, she can see, again, providence clearly enough, but she can't see grace. So all she knows is that hurt and that pain. The pleasantness has been swallowed up by the bitter. And you know, actually that language she uses is very close to the kind of language you find on the lips of Job. As he cries out to God, right, and sues for justice before the Lord. She's complaining that God has been overly severe, but she misreads God's hand in her sorrows, as we do too so very often. What she sees is arbitrary and harsh. And you know, as she wallows in the bitterness of grief, the book of Ruth wants us at least to begin to see different. And part of that new way of seeing and trusting and clinging to the Lord God of the covenant is in Ruth herself. Because she suffered too. She suffered too. But she reacts quite differently. Faithfully. Full of friendship, love, and loyalty. Can we see God's hand of grace through whatever we're facing? Through our suffering? Through the world's harsh dealings of neighbor with neighbor? You know, that's not how God would want it. That's what our faith teaches us. Most especially in Jesus. But like last week, can our faith grasp hold through it all, trusting God to work all things good? Romans 8. All things good. Is God good when you're hurting and desperate and hungry and in despair? Can you find the joy of the Lord even in that? Can you look for the hope of the very Spirit of God in the midst of it all and therefore follow after embodying that hope? As y'all have started to see when I'm preaching in the Bible, the Bible is so truthful. It shows us who we really are. It shows who God really is and who we really are. All that is a tall order, right? To live that is a tall order. But, but doesn't Ruth see it that way? Even if she doesn't see it right in front of her, she has faith that it's so. You know, we'll focus more closely on Ruth next week. But she lives out with Job, doesn't she? The Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can we say that? Or with the psalmist, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Or as Martin Luther says, faith is permitting ourselves to be seen by the things we do not see. Naomi and Ruth and we are offered a little hope at the end of the chapter, I love this, showing that God is still at work, just kind of tacks it on there at the end. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. 
just happened to be right there. So maybe as Jesus says about judgment, Naomi and we shouldn't rush too quickly to judging the God of the covenant. We're being taught to say, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purposes shall ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. God is good. God is good, amen? Oh, come on. God is good, amen? amen. The question is how we will respond to life by our faith. <coughs> <clears throat> Will they call us pleasant or bitter? Amen. If you'll please turn, oh, excuse me, affirmation of faith first. If you'll please stand and join with me.